Here's an example. Someone sent me this uh, article from Slate, the online uh, magazine. Here's an example of how history actually has a pra practical effect. Practical, right, right on the moment. As you're all aware, the uh, NCAA basketball tournament uh, kicked off last weekend, both men and women tournaments. And uh, 30, it, it, this, it, the, the initial games took place in 32 different cities across the country. But none of those cities are in the state of South Carolina or Mississippi. Anyone know why? How come they don't? They got every other state, well, 32 of them. How come no game was played in South Carolina? They got stadiums there. South Carolina or Mississippi? I didn't know either, but it is. The NCAA has a rule that they will not schedule tournament games in states where the Confederate flag still flies at the state capitol grounds. <laughs> and South Carolina and Mississippi are the two states that still have the, or it's what they call actually the Confederate battle flag, which is, it's a little complicated. It's a flag that was taken into battle, not the official flag. Nonetheless, it's the Confederate flag. Um, so uh, that's interesting. And the um, uh, South Carolina and Mississippi have failed to, uh, have not, failed to remove these flags, and so they won't host these games until they do, which means money, among other things. Um, I hate to seem like I pick on South Carolina, because I actually taught as a visiting professor there once. I have a lot of friends in South Carolina, at the University of South Carolina. They're extremely hospitable and um, generous to visitors like me. But there is something weird about the place, <laughs> as Sina pointed out. Um, so this is also, this from today, the College of Charleston. College of Charleston, a good college, has just chosen its new president. This is maybe an inside job. The, the new president is the current lieutenant governor of South Carolina. So he's just moved, all right. A lot of protest has emerged about this choice because he is a leading member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. And until recently, he ran a store in Charleston specializing in Confederate memorabilia. And um, in 2010, um, he attended a meeting of the National Federation of Republican Women dressed in a Confederate uniform and posed for a picture with two black people who appeared to be dressed as slaves. There was criticism of that. And <laughs> this is how he responded. This is, the new, this is the new president of the College of Charleston. If somebody, quote, if somebody is trying to be politically correct and use a tunnel vision on it and hook into the slavery issue, they're on a slippery slope toward narrow-mindedness and they should extend the charity of understanding. <laughs> now, if anyone turned in a sentence like that on your midterm, I'm sure that the TA circled it and warned, number one, against excessive use of cliches, tunnel vision, slippery slope, you know, as well as just the total illogic of the sentence to begin with. Anyway, all right, so the head of the local NAACP says if they wanted to call it the College of the Confederacy rather than the College of Charleston, he would be a perfect fit. So that's what's happening in South Carolina. All right, so uh, last time we talked about the sort of Confederacy, the internal history of the Confederacy, and today I want to do the same thing for the Union, the North. How did the war affect not, not just on the battlefield, how did it affect political, social, intellectual, economic life in the northern states? What was the Civil War? Was it the Second American Revolution, as the Beards called it? Was it a new birth of freedom, as Lincoln called it? Was it the end of the revolutionary tradition in America, as libertarians call it, that is, a government based on force, not consent? I, I, the way I like to think about it is to borrow a phrase, I don't even know who said this originally, it might have been Marx, it might have been Trotsky, someone said this, war is the midwife of revolution. 
War is the midwife of revolution, a very quotable phrase. Wars produce enormous changes, unanticipated generally, but they change society in fundamental ways. Big wars, not little wars, big wars change society, and the Civil War was a big war. Now the first change I want to focus on is simply what you might call nationalization, consolidation. When the war broke out, a magazine in London wrote, the war, the Civil War will draw together the northern states as they never have been drawn together yet and will finally impress them with the absolute necessity of a closer union, a stronger central power. In a word, with the duty of turning the federal government into a supreme power and creating a sovereignty where none has existed before. And I think this is very, this is really what does happen. Before the war, the federal government was a very weak institution. It was limited, it spent very little money, it had few, re you could go through your life having little or no connection with the federal government other than the Postal Service, the most important sort of function of the federal government that affected most people's lives was the post office, which was a tremendous operation uh, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, you know, and, and every town, every community had a post office. But other than that, the, the federal government barely existed. The real focus of political power was in the states and the local, um, local localities. Um, the federal government dealt with Native Americans, the federal government dealt with foreign powers. Um, it didn't do a heck of a lot other, uh, else. In the Civil War, the power, the, 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 the role of the federal government expanded in, to all sorts of realms where it had never really had a presence before. And along with that, national loyalty came to override local and state loyalty. In other words, people's just identification of who, you know, how they defined themselves. Yes, of course, before the war, people defined themselves as Americans, but very often it was through local loyalty and national loyalty aren't necessarily at odds. In fact, they often reinforce each other. But this drawing together of the nation, which this London Magazine pointed to, is one of the key um, results of the war. One of the most popular pieces of literature written during the war. This is something, I don't think, did anyone read this anymore? When I was in school, I used to read this in school. The, uh, the Man Without a Country, a story by Edward Everett Hale. I don't know if, uh, and if you have to be old enough uh, to remember that story. But anyway, Hale's story, very popular in the Civil War, is about a man who, a, a sailor, who in a fit of anger curses the name of the United States of America and he's on a naval ship. He's tried for this, and he's sentenced to live on a ship and never hear the name the United States spoken again. And the message of the story is he loses his own sense of personal identity. Without a national loyalty, you actually have no personal identity. Nation and individual are kind of merged together. You lose your sense of self if you don't have a national uh, identity. And of course, this notion of patriotism, nationalism, was distributed in all sorts of ways. Here's, this is a piece of sheet music from the war, the American flag. But here's your image of liberty holding the American flag with a sword in her hand, with the cap of liberty on her head and also on top of the flagpole. Remember the Cap of Liberty? We talked about this a while ago with the Capitol bill, the statue on top of the Capitol in Washington is the symbol of the emancipated slave from the old Roman Empire, and then, of course, a symbol in the French Revolution also. Um, here's another patriotic, um, well, we'll go to this in a minute here. This is, this is a patriotic cartoon from the beginning of the war. See what it says at the top? Annihilation to traitors. This is the Lee Eagle, the American Eagle, annihilation to traitors. It's a little hard to see, but down below are little eggs uh, representing all the states. But the southern states, the seceding states, 
are giving birth to little monsters. Little, little monsters are coming out of the southern states. But here's America, the eagle, traitors, the flag is wrapping. This is another example of the kind of patriotic imagery which is widely disseminated in the war. As well as the sort of martial spirit. This is a painting from the period, a famous painting called War Spirit at Home. War Spirit at Home. As in the painting I showed last time of Latine, the berry of Latine, it's the only adults here are two women, right? This is the home front. A, the, the mother and presumably a domestic uh, worker in the back cleaning up the dishes, but the children are marching around in a kind of army. You know, they're, they're making, they have little hats, they're marching as if they're in an army. She's reading a account of the, of the surrender of Vicksburg in a newspaper in 1863. Um, some people say that there's a bit of a bittersweet element here in the, it, again, it's hard to see that the, the folds of the newspaper actually make a cross and that maybe this is an allusion to the death in the Civil War. It's not just a celebratory thing, but the, whole, the, the martial spirit at home, the war spirit at home comes into people's families. This glorification of, um, of combat is part of this you know, nationalism that is, that is uh, uh, deeply seated in the Civil War.